Hello, beautiful people, and welcome, hi, to the Meadow Roundup for patch 3.8, the last Meadow Roundup before we start getting our new Fontaine characters. Now, if you haven't been keeping up with leaks, we have some upcoming things in 4.0. If you don't want to hear about the leaks, you can use the timestamps to skip ahead to the non-leak portion. We have had some leaks for 4.0 that some of the enemies that are going to be in Abyss are going to be reliant on you using characters from Fontaine because characters from Fontaine will have a specific mechanic that basically lets you disable the enemies and like debuff them right in the same way that quicken can be used to debuff simon those new mechanics will be used to debuff some of the en new enemies now, i haven't looked too much into how much you're gonna need slash want that but if the enemies are very cringe without the use of those debuffs it is very possible that 4.0 will have a very huge impact on what kind of teams you'll want to be playing in Abyss. But we're not in 4.0 just yet. We're still in 3.8 and in 3.8, we have honestly one of the nicest Abysses that we've had in a while. This Abyss is a lot less restrictive for team building. There are still team building incentives, but they're not actual restrictions that really force you to have a cer like certain things. In 3.7 with the triple lectors, you needed a way to break those cryo shields really fast because they were very, very big and there was more than one of them. And that very much limited the amount of teams that you could play because you had to play teams that use units that could be good enough at breaking the shields. In this abyss, while you still have a fairly tanky elemental shield, there are ways to deal with that shield that don't revolve with using its counter element. And because there's only one of them, if you take a little bit longer on this, but you make up for it by clearing the rest of the chamber a lot faster because you're playing a stronger team, you can still end up with a similar clear time. And so because of that, this is like a restriction that still leaves more freedom in team building, and so I like it a lot more. In any case, we have in the first chamber, 10 Rift Town Wells that spawn in waves of five. Uh, it's not actually in waves. You start with five and then every time you kill one, a new one spawns. And once you've killed all 10 of them, an Abyss Lecter, Fatherless Flames, and two big Rift Hounds are gonna spawn. Uh, the two Rift Hounds are gonna be on either side of the Lecter. And if you start for like at, at the right distance from them, they're fairly likely to both start with an attack where they will dash towards you, which means that the grouping is fairly easy. The second half has three Primal Constructs, followed by two Rhyme Biter Vishaps, followed by uh, two Hilly Troll Rogues and one Lava Troll. You have a lot of different waves. The consolidated HP that you have to deal with is actually fairly high, but the way that it's done, it encourages teams that have good AoE without having a DPS strength that's so high that single target teams, like it'll be impossible for them to get through. You're just gonna have to have strong Longer teams if they're single target. Chamber two, we have two Fatui Pyroslingers and two Desert Clearwaters that spawn on the first wave. They spawn fairly far away from each other, so what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna walk on the outside of the Pyroslinger so that he jumps backwards towards the middle, and then the Clearwaters are gonna run towards you, and then once you've cleared this one, you can either focus on them and then later on go to the last Spiral Slinger, or you can run to the last Spiral Slinger and they will run towards you. Once you've done that, the next wave is four husks slash Black Serpent Knights, whatever. We'll get into tips to group them properly once we're done with uh, looking at the teams and how they do. But they spawn fairly close together and it's not too difficult to keep them grouped-ish, at least grouped enough that reasonable AoE attacks will be able to hit all of them, or at the very least, most of them. In the second half, we have Simon. And then finally, Chamber 3, we have one Clearwater, one Day Thunder, that spawn. And then when you kill the first one, the Mirror Maiden is going to spawn. And when you kill the second one, the Aramite Scorching Lore Master is going to spawn. Uh, the Scorching Lore Master always starts with her first attack being summoning her animal. I don't remember what it is. Which means that you can't actually crowd control it until you destroy the animal, because it's immune to crowd control while while its animal is, is is out. So if you have crowd control, if you're using someone like Venti or Kazuha, you're gonna wanna position the center of your grouping ability on the lore master so that it pulls in the mirror maiden to where the lore master is. And then finally we have the uh coral defenders. But yeah, so all in all, chamber one uh incentivizes AoE on both sides, uh and hydro on the first chamber. Chamber two incentivizes AoE on the first side, single target on the second side, while encouraging having Electro and or, or Electro, and if possible, also Dendro. And then Chamber 3, still AoE on 
the first side and kind of AoE on the second side, but with two enemies that stand far enough away from each other a large enough portion of the fight that not every AoE character will be able to consolidate their AoE very well, and that have HP totals that are low enough that single target teams will still generally be able to clear without too much of an issue. With the summary of what the Abyss looks like, let's get into the teams. So, as usual, we're gonna start with Nilo Bloom. This is actually a very good Abyss for Nilo. First half, like we said, AoE kinda wants Hydro, or at the very least a good way to break a Pyro Shield. AoE AoE. It's a pretty heavy AoE half where you want to have Hydro. Nilo has pretty heavy AoE teams that use Hydro because she's Hydro and it's not like you've got that many options for elements you could play with her. <laughs> but yeah, so Nilo Bloom is actually very good in this abyss. Uh, this is one of the most favorable Nilo abysses we've had in a fairly long time. And I've been saying this for a while, but I think that generally when abysses are Nilo abysses, they tend to be more fun. When abysses are made to make Nilo fans happy, they tend to incentivize more AoE. And that's just generally more fun. So I like that, and uh, yeah, very good abyss for Nilo. And when Nilo's good, Virgin's good, because Virgin is just Nilo with extra steps. <laughs> Like that, that, like Nilo's passive is literally just remove the last step of Burgeon. You basically get Burgeon without needing Pyro. So if it's a good abyss for Nilo, it's also going to be a good, good abyss for Burgeon. And Burgeon is also very good in the first side of this abyss. Uh, both of them, I think, are pretty shit on the second side. They're not unplayable, but Simon is a very harsh barrier for both Nilo teams and Burgeon teams. Uh, when you don't have Electro or Quicken, I mean, even if you have Electro, when you don't have Quicken, you have to destroy the summons that Simon creates when it goes invisible, and you can't apply elements to them or trigger reactions on them. And they, you actually damage them through normal damage. Not, it's not like element, like it's not an elemental shield check. It's not a bluntness check. Like it, it's, it's just you have to deal damage to them. But Nilo teams generally are, and, and Burgeon teams as well, are generally a lot more heavily focused on reaction damage than talent damage, which makes it a lot harder to deal with the summons very quickly, which means you're going to lose some time on that, which means you're losing some uptime on your damage. And then on top of that, they don't tend to be the, like not, neither Burgeon teams nor Nilo teams tend to be the greatest in single target because they're creating less seeds, so they're not doing as much damage. So all in all, can you push past it with enough investment? Yes, but this is definitely not the greatest. And yeah, you can deal bloom damage to the summons, but you have to trigger bloom on Simon and then have those cores deal damage to the summons. And the timing on that is very, very tight. And it's not gonna happen that reliably unless you're actively looking for it, which can be very difficult because Simon has a lot of inconsistency in terms of how long it takes to go invisible after doing its attacks. I think it's because of hit lag, but I'm not entirely sure. I haven't done enough testing on it to be sure. Anyways, point being, it doesn't matter because Neo teams are good in the first side. So there's no real reason to try to play them on the second side, unless you just really wanna show that she can clear both sides, which like, yeah, she can, but not very favorable on the second side, either for Burgeon or Nilo, but very, very good on the first side. Uh, next up, Hyper Bloom. This abyss is one of the least Hyper Bloom friendly abysses we've had in a fairly long time. And so in other words, Hyper Bloom is pretty good. This abyss, <laughs> it's hard to make Hyper Bloom bad. The content is very AOE focused on the first chamber, which makes some of the Hi Hyper Bloom teams a little bit worse, but you can play an AOE Hydro unit like Ayato or Kokomi in your Hyper Bloom team. More Ayato than Kokomi because Kokomi's AOE is a little scuffed sometimes, but even then, right? You, you, can, you can use a character like Ayato in your Hyper Bloom team and it's an AOE team now. <laughs> So even if it's not like necessarily the most favorable, it's not that bad for Hyperloom on the first side. Uh, second side has the potential issue where it's a more single target focused teams. So uh, it's a more single target focused team if you're not playing with someone like Ayato. So this is not like the most favorable that it can be, but it's still more than fine. This is not the best abyss for Hyperbloom, but Hyperbloom's baseline is strong enough that even a below average abyss 
is still a good abyss for Hyper Bloom. All right, next up, Mono Pyro. Mono Pyro is very interesting because obviously Mono Pyro on the first side, don't do it. This shit is gonna be the bane of your existence. It is possible to deal enough damage with like your animal units or whatever to the elemental shield that the Fatherless Flames Lecter has, but it's just... It, it, like, you are torturing yourself if you're doing that. If you're into that, I'm not gonna judge, but you should know what you're getting into before you get into it. Uh, if you do manage to get past it, though, obviously, Chambers 2 and 3 are both fairly good for Monopyro. On the second half, though, Chamber 1 is obviously very good for Monopyro. Chamber 2 is very interesting, because while it doesn't have Quicken, so it doesn't have a way to deal with the invisible phase instantly, Mono Pyro relies almost entirely on talent damage, not on reaction damage, which means that it gets through the summons very, very quickly, right? I I, I did a, a clear a few days ago because someone wanted me to show Taser on the first side and I just didn't know what to play on the second side, so I just played Mono Pyro. And I think I show a very good example of how fast teams with high talent damage can deal with the summons from Simon, right? So as you can see, it's starting with its first attack. Woohoo. Pog. All right, it's going to go invisible soon. It summons his... Uh, it summons. And they're dead. So from it going invisible, which happens after the summon, to the summons dying, there was... All right, it goes invisible at 831, 830-ish. The summons are dead at 831, 830-ish. There, it's less than a second. Now, after that, you still have to wait for these things to go through, but you can start setting up your next rotation already, even while it's invisible, because it doesn't stay invisible for that long. It's about 10 seconds, right? So it went invisible. We broke the thing at around 31 or 30. He came back visible at about 21. So he stays invisible for only about 10 seconds on that second invisibility phase. So if you have a lot of talent damage, you can deal with Simon fairly easily, even without an Electro unit. Yeah, also, if you manage to destroy the disc before before it goes invisible, it just won't go invisible at all, but that's very difficult to do. Well, with that said, Monopyro can get through this fairly easily, even without Electro or, or Dendro. And then, obviously, it's going to have a good matchup against these because your Shangling's AoE is fairly large and uh, you're not relying on reaction, so your Hydro Application's AoE doesn't actually matter because you don't have Hydro Application. But yeah, so overall actually fairly good abyss for mono for mono pyro um, but while mono pyro can get through this and it's still good it's not the, the team that this kind of enemy is designed for that would fall to aggravate and spread teams because obviously when you trigger quicken on simon while he's invisible he isn't invisible anymore and it's not just that it goes that he goes visible he also gets stunned which means that it's going to take longer for it to do its attack that turns it invisible again in the first side aggravate is like all right you're generally not really relying on hydro units and aggravate teams so this isn't the best but you can still kind of brute force it because Fischl's Electro Application is so high that she can almost single-handedly deal with this bullshit. Whereas with Spread Teams, it's a little bit easier to fit Hydro Units in Spread Teams and play like the good old Quick Bloom teams, but they don't tend to have the best AoE. So they're like, neither Aggravate nor Spread would be like my number one recommendation for the first half, but they're actually very good for the second half. Obviously, I don't really think I have to say too much about Simon. Quicken on Simon makes Simon go zzzz, like zzzz, like he's sleeping. The enemy spawn close enough that you don't necessarily, like the first wave and second wave spawn close enough that you don't necessarily need to have really big AoE. And then the third wave is groupable without needing crowd control just by relying on enemy AI. So it's also fairly fine if you don't have the best AoE, which means that both spread and quicken can get past it. Now, obviously, if you have grouping, that's going to be easier. And generally spread teams, it's a little bit harder to fit in an animal unit than aggravate teams. So... I'd probably lean a little bit more store, a little bit more towards aggravate than towards spread, but both of them are very, very good in uh, in this abyss. Uh, next up, on field vape. This is not the best abyss for on-field vape units. So when I talk about on-field vape, I'm talking about Hutao, Yoimiya, or their lesser versions, the Luke, 
Plea Double Hydro, Yunfei, other such things. Those teams are alright this abyss, but they're not the best. They tend to have a lot worse AoE than Changling teams. So in the first side, they're generally not the greatest. On the second side, they're a little bit more playable. Some of them are going to struggle a bit more against Simon, but it shouldn't be too much of a problem. The more single target focused ones can struggle a tiny bit against this as well. But like I mentioned at the beginning, they don't have so much HP that it's impossible to get past with single target teams. It's just a bit, a little bit harder. Uh, all in all, on-field pyro teams don't really have any chamber where, you know, that's where they shine. But they're baseline is strong enough that they can still get through an abyss that isn't necessarily the best for them. I'd say this is a below average abyss for on-field pyro units, but it's still reasonable. Like, it's not going to be painful to get through. What would be painful to get through is try and freeze on the second side, because obviously... Boss, unfreezable. Boss, unfreezable. However, we actually have a good freeze of this because first side is really good for freeze. It's AoE chambers with all freezable and groupable enemies. Groupable-ish. The, the big rift towns are only are not actually groupable, but they are staggerable. And once you group them once by staggering them into each other, you can freeze them and keep them there. So it's not. But you get the point, right? They're generally groupable and freezable enemies in AoE. This is a very good abyss for freeze. Next up, Mono Hydro. Every time I talk about Mono Hydro, I repeat myself. I don't like Mono Hydro. I think it's a bit of a waste. It's a good team because you can't really go wrong with Sinto Kazuha Yulan. But the last slot being a third Hydro unit rather than like an Electro unit to take advantage of Kazuha's damage generally tends to lead to really bad AoE output without actually providing an improvement in single target output over the alternatives that you might have. And so because of that, I don't tend to like the team very much, although it is still a very solid team. This Abyss though, it is with a heavy heart that I have to tell you that there is actually a reason to play Mono Hydro over other options. Because there's a Pyro Shield, and Pyro Shields is like the only real strong enough incentive, in my opinion, to want to play Mono Hydro over stuff like Taser or like Double Hydro with a Pyro Carry or stuff like that. I'm still not that huge of a fan because the other chambers are pretty heavy AoE focus, but it is playable. It's actually a reasonable Mono Hydro of this. Significantly above average for Mono Hydro. Anyways, next up we got the Hyper Carries. It is no secret that I don't like Hyper Carries carries. I know that units that incentivize vertical investment mean that if you want to get the best results out of them, you're going to need to vertically invest. And if you vertically invest, you're not going to have as many primo gems to be able to go for as many different characters, which means that you're more likely to end up spending or, to, or you're more likely to end up in a situation where you, if you weren't planning to spend, you have to choose between not getting the unit you want or spending when you weren't really planning on it. That being said, many people enjoy the game in different ways than I do. And if you don't really feel the desire to pull for different characters and play different teams and you're okay with only playing one team and just using your primos to make that team stronger. Or if you have a lot of spare disposable income that you can spend on your entertainment, then you're going to have great success with hyper carry teams. In terms of how hyper carry teams do in this abyss compared to others, I'd say that this is actually a fairly decent one. Let's start with Wanderer because obviously he's on banner right now. I'm not a big fan of Wanderer for this abyss at the general investment I look at, but there is like a huge huge difference in how good Wonder feels to play against Husks with and without C6 Farazon. More than just with the like basic, he does more damage obviously and Farazon's ER is better. You can also actually get good enough grouping. And more importantly, you get enough stagger that it's easier to get away without a defensive unit. So you can more easily get away by using a grouper instead. And also Farazon being C6 boosts your grouper's damage more, which is nice. Without a grouper, Wanderer generally feels really shit here. And with a grouper, without C6 Farazon, it can be hard to not feel like shit. With C6 Farazon though, it's actually pretty good. Uh, C6 Farazon also increases the amount of animal application that your team has, which is going to make it easier to get through the fatherless flames because you're destroying its shield faster. For the second chamber, or for the second half, I think it's whatever. I don't like units that don't snapshot their damage as much against Simon's invisible stuff because it's going to take you a decent amount of time to break the things without things like Bennett buff. But if you use your Bennett burst to break the things, then you're not going to have it when it stops being invisible, which 
makes it a little bit more awkward to do, but with enough investment, it won't really be a problem. Uh, you can also try to time your stuff so that you start your rotation with Bennett buff active and all that before it goes invisible, not like right before, but like six, seven seconds before. So you do like six, seven seconds of DPS and then it spawns the summons and you can use the end of your rotation to break the summons and then it lines up very well for the rest. With these, Wanderer tends to have AoE that's too small to hit them reliably because they don't tend to get very close together and they have very large hitboxes that can't overlap, which means that Unless they're really, really, really close together, most of your attacks won't hit both. Now, you can manipulate their AI to make them close together, but only after certain attacks, which means that they will spend a decent amount of time not being that close together. Now, obviously, the same thing as with, like, the, the on-field pyro teams from earlier, it's still fairly easy to overcome if you have enough investment because they're not that tanky. But in terms of like how Wanderer does in this abyss compared to the average abyss, I'd say it's about average. I don't think it's a particularly favorable abyss for him because there are a few things that are not ideal for him, but it's also not that unfavorable because those things that are not ideal for him aren't that big of a deal generally. I think if you look at Chao, you're going to find something fairly similar. With Chao, you're gonna have a little bit more trouble breaking the Fatherless Flame Shield because he doesn't apply quite as much Animo as Wanderer does, so less elemental application means slower shield breaking. But in exchange for that, you're gonna have significantly better AoE and it's gonna be a lot easier to do the rest of the chamber, right? So you will have more time to break the shield and to do the following chambers as well. All in all, maybe Xiao is like a little bit better than Wanderer in this abyss, but it's not really that different. You're not really dealing with the kinds of enemies that showcase the situations where Wanderer is significantly better than Xiao, or the situations where Xiao is significantly better than Wanderer. They're both fairly reasonable in this abyss. Uh, next up for other carries, you're gonna have Raiden. Uh, Raiden is actually pretty good in this abyss. When you're playing Hyper Raiden with Sarah, you're probably gonna struggle a decent amount to break the shield because you just don't have that much electro application but if you do the smart thing bench that dog sarah unit and use fischl instead this shield is going to disappear in like a very short period although to be fair this is actually the kind of abyss where outside of this chamber sarah at least at c6 before c6 just don't play that at least at c6 sarah can actually feel better than fischl because you have a lot of aoe but it's gonna feel worse enough in chamber one that I'd still just recommend Fischl. Uh, but you can also play her in chamber two. She's an electro unit, so it makes Simon a little bit easier to deal with. And uh, she, her AoE is big enough that she can hit both Vishops without there being too much of a problem. I guess other hyper carries would be like Ayla. She's okay, Elizabeth. I'd say that this is like slightly below average because the Coral Defenders have a few attacks that make them move a lot. And while those attacks are predictable, you can see them coming like five seconds before they do it. Five seconds isn't enough for, I don't know. From the time where you cast your ult to the time where your ult falls by itself, that's about 10 seconds. But that's assuming your setup is already done and you're casting your ult. It's realistically, from the time where you decide you want to cast your ult to the time where your ult falls, it's closer to like 12. Which means that in order to hit them, sometimes you're gonna have to swap out early and that's gonna make it a little bit cringe. Uh, that being said, it's not that huge of a deal because again, these enemies are just not that much of a problem generally. They're just not that tanky. A lot of their like quote unquote difficulty is based on the premise that there's a chance you don't kill both of them at the same time. And then if you don't, then the one that you healed first can heal back up. But as long as you play carefully and you don't just like forget to stop attacking one if it's low and the other one isn't, that's not gonna happen. And when you don't deal with that mechanic, they are actually fairly easy to kill. The other chambers are actually pretty decent for her. Obviously, Simon has its potential issues with the invisibility, but Arla has very decent, like very reasonable. I'd even go so far as to say good damage when it comes to like talent damage without setups, which means that she's actually pretty good at dealing with the summons that Simon spawns when he goes invisible. Uh, so Simon is actually not that big of a problem for her. And then this chamber, not really that big of a problem for any team, really. First side, this makes it a little scuffed. You can always put hydro units on her team. It's a little bit less popular of an option, but it is not as bad as people think. And the other ones are fine as well. Humanoid enemies have lower physical resistance, which makes it easier to kill them. All in all, 
this is an average-ish abyss for her. Nothing crazy, nothing terrible, kind of just okay. Next up, we have Taser. Taser is actually very good this abyss. One of the biggest, like, potential downsides to Taser is that in a lot of situations, there's not that many reasons to play it over Aggravate. The difference in damage is not actually big. They're kind of interchangeable, but people generally tend to prefer playing Aggravate because it's often a bit easier to play, I guess. I think players very often forget that a team or a unit or an archetype is good because it's a bit less popular, so they haven't heard about it in a while. And I think that's the case with Taser. I think Taser is a lot better than people give it credit for nowadays. But in any case, Taser is very good this abyss. Uh, you got Hydro to deal with this while also having very good AoE to deal with all of them, all the chambers. You have Electro to deal with Simon while having decent single target and really good two target damage with Beto's ult. All in all, Taser is just pretty good right now. Next up, Overvape, which is vape teams with an Electro unit. I would say that Overvape is a bit better than just straight up vape in general in this abyss, at least for the on-field uh, pyros, because the on-field pyros don't really have the greatest AoE, so you'd rather play them on chamber two, and then if you're playing them on chamber two, Electro is very nice. There's also not too many enemies that you can stagger in ways that are actually going to like hurt your clears with overload on the second side. It's only the hatchlings here, and then like to some extent the rogues, but if you do your setups properly, you're generally gonna push them in the same direction, so it's not actually gonna hurt you. Then we have national teams, so just Shangling vape teams in general. Very good, this abyss. One of the one of the nicest abysses for national. It's hard to make an abyss that's bad for national, but you've got the hydro requirement, you've got the AoE requirement. Just on the first side, national is very nice. Second side, it's not as nice, but it's still playable, but I would generally stick to the first side, unless you already have a really good first side team and you're looking for a good, a good second side team. Next up, Salad. Uh, this is actually a very good abyss for salad one of the things that salad has is it has grouping quicken and hydro it has a way to deal with all of the like team building restrictions that you have on each chamber and each side which means that salad is a very good team to just have as your second team because it fits everywhere and it's also pretty good everywhere next up hyper fridge unfortunately this is one of the worst abysses for hyper fridge that we've had since dendro's release it's still playable you can play hyper fridge on the first side but hyper bloom teams with only one hydro unit generally tend to be more single target focused Focused. Uh, and yeah, Hyper Fridge is uh, Hyper Bloom with a Crow unit. So you can only have one Hydro. You really want the Hydro to be synced so if, if it can be, which means that you're not going to have as good Hydro application in AoE. So on Chamber 1, it's a little bit more sus. And then on Chamber 2, you can't freeze them, right? You can't freeze the Coral Defenders. You can't freeze Simon. So it's just generally going to be a downgrade over Hyper Bloom, like normal Hyper Bloom teams or Salad teams in basically everything in this Abyss, uh, in, in every every situation in this Abyss. So I, I wouldn't recommend it for this one. I'll Obviously, it's still a Hyperloom team, so you can still use it and it's still gonna clear, but it's it's not the one I'd recommend. Oven! So Oven, for those of you who don't know, is a Burgeon team with a Quarrow unit. Uh, and Oven is actually very strong in this abyss. Oven is more focused on AoE damage, and so you can play it on the team that has freeze or on the side that has freezable enemies, and you will still have good AoE damage because it's a Burgeon team, right? You want to be playing Hydro units that have good AoE application if you can. Uh, if your Hydro units themselves don't have good AoE application, you're still generating Burgeon at the very least, and Burgeon has AoE, but you can also kind of just move around a lot, and because you can freeze the enemies, you can maintain them more tightly grouped than a basic Burgeon team that doesn't have the option to freeze. Overall, Oven is pretty nice to Abyss, but it's not the only Burgeon archetype that is nice to Abyss. So next up we have Sauté, which is a Burgeon team with an animal unit, uh, which generally uses the animal unit as the trigger rather than the pyro unit themselves, so you use something like Bennett as your pyro unit, and then you get a pyro infusion on Kazuha's burst or something like that. And Sote is actually very good this abyss because it has grouping and it has hydro. So it's nice on the first side. Very cool. Next up we have Curry, which is a Burgeon team with Electro unit that doesn't really interfere with your Burgeon. So someone like Fischl or Beto. It also includes the Thundering Furry team, the on-field Burgeon Razor. This is unfortunately one of the worst abysses for Curry we've had since Dendro's release. It is playable and it's fine 
on the second side, but it's not great on the second side. It's just fine. Chamber 1 can be a little bit annoying because the enemies get staggered so much when you're playing stuff like Razor, because since you're triggering a reaction on yourself rather than on the enemy, it's harder to make them the enemies go in the same direction. Uh, whereas if you're playing stuff like Toma or something like that, it, it's it's going to be all right. But I mean, it's less it's less AOE on the other chambers, and that's really where Curry is at, at its best. And you don't want to be playing an overload focus teams on the first side because you're just going to ungroup the enemies so much. It's still fine because the teams are just strong, but this is again a uh, below average abyss for curry teams. Next up, we have Mono Geo. So I I'm sure some of you were probably wondering where the heck is Ito when I was talking about hypers. I decided to just put him in Mono Geo instead of hypers. I think it's different enough that it can be in there. I don't like Ito very much this abyss. Shields are generally not a great thing to have against husks especially when the pyro husk hits you it gives an elemental shield to all of the husks around it which is a huge pain in the ass uh, if you dodge everything perfectly uh, ito is actually fairly good this abyss uh, ito has a reasonably good matchup against rift hounds because his stagger isn't like backwards on his charge attacks like it, it's like it's interruption without being stagger it's it's weird but it doesn't ungroup the enemies that much basically is, is, is what i'm getting at so against the big rift hounds he actually feels fairly Really nice the application against the fatherless flames is like not great on geo but you can you can slot in a hydro unit as your last slot or you can just brute force it because you can have a lot of application in total it's fine this is like the challenge but if you dodge everything it's not going to be much of a problem and this one's fine. Uh, second side doesn't feel that great. I don't like Ito against Simon because it's very difficult to set up your rotations in ways where you can easily kill the summons without wasting your Ito burst to kill the summons. It's not impossible to do, but it is going to require some creative team building. One thing, if you really want to play Mono Geo because maybe you have vertical investment into it, so you want to play it anyways, or you just really like Ito, it's still it's still playable, right? What you want to do is you want to be building your Zhongli, if you're using Zhongli, full damage rather than for his shield, so that you can use Zhongli's burst as a way to help you destroy the, um, destroy the summons from Simon more easily without needing to use Ito's burst on it. Yeah. And then your, your last slot, you can replace either Zhongli or Albedo with someone like Sing so or Yilan to have better like talent damage to break the summons more easily. And that can make it nicer. Or you can use Kuki and uh, deal with the second invisibility phase more easily, which is also nice. All in all, it's fine, but it's not great. This is definitely a below average abyss for Ito. Finally, we have Soup. Uh, Soup is basically a taser team with a pyro unit uh and soup is pretty reasonable this abyss nothing crazy i i, I don't like the like kazuha variations of soup on the first side because you just have too much overload with not enough grouping so i don't like it too much i prefer the sucrose variations a lot because you're ha you have more grouping from an on-field sucrose than an off-field kazuha and people don't really play on-field kazuha in, in soup teams all in all like it's it's all right to play with kazuha but i would generally at least on the first side, prefer it with Sucrose, uh, stuff like uh, Suko Komon and, and all that good stuff. And then second side, um, they're both all right. But yeah, and that basically does it for the archetypes. Now that we've done that, let's go through how to properly group the enemies and deal with their mechanics very well, as well as showcase a clear with the Zajef Endorse recommended teams for this abyss. <laughs> so first chamber, it doesn't really matter where you go at the beginning. You can try to position yourself to, to have your AOE hit everything, but the first attack from the Rift Hound Whelps, if they're too far from you to be in your AOE, is going to be them teleporting on you. But really doesn't matter that much. Uh, and then you have two waves of Whelps, and after that you have Wolf, Lecter, Wolf. There is not that much to say about this one, so let's just get right into it. How did it not? I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just very confused by what the f is going on.
Eh, it's okay. Not my best clear, but... That's alright. Alright, now well, let's do this. first two ways and then you just run here and you dodge this attack and then you go over here and then they're just gonna group themselves and I'm a little corange so that wasn't the best but that's okay my olds, man. I'm gonna have to. It is what it is. Okay. We are good. So, to show properly what's going on, right? The first two waves, they're very straightforward. First wave spawns in front of you, you run towards it. Second wave spawns behind you, you run towards it. And after that, you just run to the side. So what's gonna happen is you have the Abyss Chamber. First wave spawns here. Second wave spawns here. And then third wave, the two rogues spawn here, and the Law of Eternal spawns here. What you wanna do is you wanna run all the way over here so that you're around this angle, right? Somewhere around here. You don't really wanna go here because then the Law of Eternal is gonna end up up a little bit further away than if you were standing somewhere around here, but it's not that big of a deal. The main point is you need to be far away enough from this guy that he's too far to do his range attacks. And so the only thing that he can do is walk until he's close enough to do his range attack. And he's gonna walk close enough to his friend. And that's what we did just there. All right, for this one, you wanna run to this one. He's gonna eventually dash backwards. I guess I staggered him too much. Man, Singcho has too much staggered. I'll, I'll, I'll show it again without using Singcho. Alright, so usually his first attack is going to be the jump backwards one. So by going on the exterior of him, you basically force him to do the attack that gets him the closest to the other ones. Now here, basically always try to, oops, always try to stick as close to the cryo one as you can, because the cryo one is the cringe one, and he's the one that walks, or that runs backwards when it runs. Also, I accidentally got a parry, which means that they did their enrage attack, which is actually very bad because it makes their moveset a lot harder to deal with. It's like the main downside of using Beto on the first side. It's you're getting a shield, but it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Let's heal back up a little. There we go. Next up, we have Simon. So uh, with a team like this, you can kind of just bash your head against the wall and it's gonna work out all right so you just hit the thing and the thing is hit uh one thing to keep in mind is while it's invisible, you're always going to auto-target towards it over towards the summon things. Or, sorry, towards the summons over towards it. So if you're relying on energy gen- or... Yeah, if, if you're relying on energy generation while he's invisible, right? Like, so like here, right? If I E, it's going to make me E this way and I'm not going to get energy. So I have to go behind it in, if I want to make sure I get my energy. Also... I might have up a little bit too much there. <laughs> I might have taken too... No, I'm good. I'm good, I'm good. 
It actually, nah, whatever. But yeah, so you're going to be auto-targeting on the summons. So in the second invisible phase, when you're doing your setup, if you don't have enough energy, make sure that you position yourself far enough from the summons that Simon is between you and the summons. All right, next up. Uh, for this one, you want to be targeting the desert clear water first, right? The, the hydro one, because she has the, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, the, the, the cringe is what she has. But this thing... The thing is like slowing waters, yes, thank you chat. Which uh, significantly extends your cooldowns. So you want to try to kill it before it pulses for the first time if you can, right? So that's why you will generally want to be targeting her first. And if everything goes right. You will be fine then. You are so cringe, Mirror Maiden. I don't want to mash aggressively. I'm too tilted. <laughs> A little bit of tomfoolery there, but that's okay. All right, and then here, uh, one thing about this, the, these guys is, as you can see, right, they're starting with the same attack, which means that their second attack is guaranteed to be the one that brings them, oh, no, it's not. Yes, it is, okay. It's guaranteed to be the one that brings them together. If they start with a different attack, their second attack will generally not be this one. So you'll want to keep that in mind and look at their first attack before choosing what to do. Oh, can you just... Oh my. This is not my best, but that's okay. Am I gonna... Oh my... Ain't no way. No, we're fine. We're fine. We're alright. We spin to win. Alright, so... <laughs> well, that basically does it. Just keep in mind, if they start with the same attack, their second attack is almost always gonna be the one where they go together. If they start with a different attack, uh, you generally have a little bit more time. Make sure you don't kill both of them at like two different intervals. You wanna make sure that their health is going down at around the same rate. And yeah, that's basically it. For the first side, keep in mind that the Mirror Maiden can be crowd controlled until it hits you for the first time. So dodge the damn attacks if you wanna crowd control it. Uh, we, we can do it again with uh, different teams. We'll do our setup properly, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> oh my, I am, I am bad. It's okay. Make sure we finish with our bursts up and... Oh, I'm... I have them on an order I'm not used to. Fuck. I'm gonna swap to the wrong character. Oh no. I swapped to the wrong character and now it's, it's... Now it's pain. It's fine, whatever. I don't want to talk about it, man.
What the fuck is Gro doing? I feel like it's moving more than it usually does. Uh, I mean, it kind of kind of depends, right? Give me, give me a second. I'll just. All right, let, let's pretend you guys didn't see that, okay? I don't need to do this actually. Oh, I am bad. I'll do a melee burst, because otherwise I can't get good enough grouping. No, don't... Don't be cringe. Whatever, man. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, you guys didn't see that. I know that was ugly as... All right, I don't want to talk about it. I just, I, I don't want to talk about it, okay? Shut up. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, because international is internating, but... All right. I that up so bad, oh my god. Wow, look, look at that amazing Dendro main character burst. That's it's it's great. I love it. Don't, don't you guys love it? Sock mod check. Whatever. We're actually gonna. I am. I really don't want to talk about it. No, don't. Better. Just, oh, I'm so, dude, I, I'm too rusty on this team. I haven't played it in too long. I did not get a pyro swirl. No, I did get a pyro swirl. I'm just blind. Yeah, so make sure you dodge this attack that way you will still be able to group the Maiden. And you're not gonna have to cry because they're 83 feet away from each other. Now I can get hit, because they've already been grouped enough. All right, next up. But yeah, so now, right, because they're starting with a different attack, they're going to take a little bit longer to ungroup themselves. But they do still do it eventually. You're gonna want to stand. Oh my god, I'm being cringed. Gonna want to stand in this position to make uh, the cryo one dash towards you. Ugh. Makes it easier to get them grouped up. Ugh. use this team for, for the showcase though because it's like I'm so rusty on it I'm making it look bad and eh, whatever it, it's it's good enough 